Once you've got your song books uh, marked, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is where we're going to pick up our study from this morning. As I said in the announcements, it's good to see everyone out this morning. We have a good crowd, several that are here with us. I also see several uh, visitors that are with us. I neglected to notice that uh, Joe Neal and, and Savannah were here this morning. I won't say visiting. This is this is home, of course, but uh, glad to see them home from college and glad to have all those that might be visiting with us here this morning. So last week at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, we saw that Jesus called His 12 apostles. And He was sending them on this mission. That's what an apostle is. It's one that's commissioned on behalf of another uh, to represent another. And they were, of course, representing the message of Christ. So we see that they were commissioned to take a very specific message to the Jews. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We've seen that over and over in the book of Matthew. We also saw that was the, the theme of the Sermon on the Mount as well. And last week, as we looked at the very beginning of this chapter, we saw several principles that I believed, even though he was giving them this, you know, these rules or this information for this limited commission, he was giving them some principles that I think easily pertain to the Great Commission that we as Christ's disciples have been given that we won't see until Matthew chapter 28. For example, last week we talked about how they specifically, they had a limited scope to focus on. They were to focus on the Jews. Now our commission, of course, is to all the nations. But they were to focus on the Jews. And we talked about different reasons why that may be a benefit. They were to focus on those who were worthy. In other words, those that were receptive. They were to focus on those things that Jesus had told them to share. Primarily that thought that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So as we get further into this discussion, we're going to see that Jesus is going to tell them more about this mission. And we're going to see how these things perhaps pertain to our mission as well. So for example, He tells them right from the beginning in, chapter, or in verse 16, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that they ought to expect persecution. Verse 16, He tells them, He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep into the midst of wolves. In other words, this mission that they were going on, it was going to be a threat to their own personal safety. It was not going to be a pleasant experience. It's actually kind of interesting. I was thinking about this illustration of sheep and wolves. And we also see that illustration in the context of talking about uh, the subject of false teachers. In that circumstance, though, the wolf is dressed as a sheep and he's among a bunch of different sheep. And even in that description of a false teacher, the false teacher is seen as very dangerous. But in this case, the sheep are in the minority. They're going out among the wolves. Very dangerous. So he gave them an idea of what to expect as they go on this mission regarding this persecution. For example, in verse 17, he says, they will throw you into court. In verse 17, they will flog you. Verse 18, they'll take you before governors and before kings. Drop down to verse 21. He says your own families may be the ones that turn against you and lead you to persecution or to death. Verse 22, he says you will be hated. How's that for a mission? Again, he's sending them out on this mission. And he's describing all the things that they ought to anticipate. How is that to set up this mission that they're about to go on? mentor of mine was once telling me a story uh, from when he was back in the military. And he said at one point in time during his service, his group, they were being sent out into this battle and they were told that as they went, the majority of them were not going to survive. So after that mission, of course, later on he told me that there was a, a story later on that followed that. And I don't know how long it was after this. But on one of the later missions, they were told, they says, as you go on this mission, none of you will come back home. Now, obviously, that didn't come true. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to tell me that story. But imagine that feeling. You're being told, you're being sent on this mission. And it will most certainly lead to something bad. Maybe your death. And yet, you still have the resolve to go. These apostles, they were being sent on this commission. Jesus does not sugarcoat it. It's going to be hard. From a worldly standpoint, it may cost you everything. 
And yet they still had the resolve to go. Why was that? He says at the end of verse 22, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Brethren, when it comes to our mission to serve the Lord and to spread the gospel, we ought to anticipate persecution. He says in verse 24 and 25, he says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they had called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? Now this is a point that Jesus is also going to make later on. He makes this in John chapter 15. This was something that Jesus even talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We ought to anticipate persecution. And there's a benefit to anticipating persecution because if we anticipate it, we're going to be better prepared on how we react. It's often that when we are approached with something or when we're confronted with something and we're caught off guard, what happens is our reaction may not be what we want it to be. Our reaction may be unrighteous. But we ought to anticipate it. And by anticipating it, we ought to be prepared that when we face those things, we ought to rejoice and be glad as He told us to be in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12. A few different applications I think we can make from this section. The first application I think we need to realize is that not everyone is going to receive the message that we share in a positive way. Because on the most basic level, for example, maybe you're going out and you're trying to reach the lost. Maybe one of the popular things that people do is uh, they'll go door knocking. I've done that a, a handful of times. You may have the door slammed in your face. As you meet people and as they learn what you stand for, you may find that you are not invited to certain places. You may not be invited among certain groups of people. In some cases, though, as he was warning the apostles, it may be a lot more it may be a lot worse than that. We should expect that we may offend or some people may be angry regarding the truth that we share. Reality is as we've talked about in the past, people do not like to be told that they need to make corrections. People do not like the idea of being told that they are lost eternally. So again, you may find some negative reactions. You may lose some friends. You may be made fun of. And as the apostles was the case for them, you may even suffer physical harm. But as we said, if we anticipate it, we ought to be able to respond in the right way. Rather than responding with anger or being upset, you know, how could they possibly you know, persecute me for this message? What does Jesus say in Matthew 5? We'll bless those who curse us. And as we already said, we will rejoice for being persecuted for the cause of Christ. Not only that, but to add to that, think about what James 1 teaches us. James 1 teaches us that trials are a potential opportunity for what? For spiritual growth. He says the testing of our faith that can produce patience. So if we anticipate it, we can, take it, we can use it for good. So he goes on over the next few verses or so. And he goes on starting in verse 26 to say that the apostles ought not fear those that persecute them. So he's latching on to what he's just been talking about. Again, he was revealing to them uh, things as he was teaching his disciples that he wanted them to be willing to proclaim. And he wanted them to proclaim those things boldly. He says, proclaim it on the housetops. And for them, that could be a scary thought. For us, it could be as well. Because the things that he was telling them to proclaim, again, they might be faced with the threat of death. And they were supposed to take that message boldly. And realizing the, the potential persecution or the potential consequence of proclaiming those things boldly, it might cause them to be fearful. And that fear, it might cause them to be less bold. But he makes the point, look at verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear Him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The point is made that we ought to fear God and not man. You think about the book of Acts. We talk about different ex uh, evidences of why 
we put our faith in Christ. And there's a bunch of different reasons why we do that. But one thing that we ought not overlook is you think about the witnesses of Christ. You think about those that were proclaiming the message of Christ. Part of the evidence of the validity of their claims that He was the Christ and that He was raised is that they boldly proclaimed it, not backing down even in the face of death. Don't underestimate that when we're thinking about the witnesses of Christ. What often happens is, um, what often happens, and this is human nature, is that often we are a lot more concerned with what man thinks than what God thinks. We're concerned about the here and the now. We're concerned about what we might lose here. We're concerned about potentially the pain that we might endure here. Yet logically, as you've been going with me through the book of Matthew, I want to ask you the question, even in the first nine, ten chapters that we've been looking at, how clear has it been made that it is completely illogical to be more concerned about the things of this world in comparison with eternal matters? I think that's been made abundantly clear and it will continue to be that way. Paul in in Galatians 1 in verse 10, the context here, he's talking about those that might preach a false gospel. He says, For am I now seeking the approval of man Or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. The thing that we see throughout the Scriptures is that God will take care of His people. We see that in Genesis. If we continue that study in the Old Testament, we're going to see that when they're out in the wilderness. We're going to continue to see God will take care of those that belong to Him. And I believe at that point, if we were to read this in full, that point is illustrated in this passage as well. God knows who are His. He knows all about us. And if we're willing to acknowledge Jesus before man, I guarantee you He tells us He sees that. He's going to remember that. And more importantly, He's going to remember that when we stand at judgment. Verse 33, you see what we really ought to fear. Look at verse 33. Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Put yourself in that situation. We're at judgment. We need someone to intercede on our behalf because of the sins that we've had in our life. And Jesus denies us as being one of His own. What a fearful, what a desperate situation that would be. And yet understand, that is exactly the position that we put ourselves in when we fear proclaiming Jesus before others. An application I think we get from this is that if we truly fear and if we truly have reverence from God, we are not going to let the fear of the world interfere with our mission to do God's will. We're going to worry a lot less about what other people think about us. We're not going to be, we won't be worried about trying to please the world. We'll be seeking to please God first and foremost in all that we do. So as you start reading the next section, and I'm going to read this somewhat in full here, you might start to raise an eyebrow over the next three verses or so. And you're wondering what point Jesus is making here. Notice what He says, verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Verse 36, And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. So without the context surrounding this, it might sound as if Jesus is wanting His people to be a pretty terrible people. Jesus has taught His disciples over and over that His people are going to be motivated by love in all that they do. So is there a contradiction? He said, I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. That doesn't sound very loving. But I think as we go forward in verses 37 through 39, we get a very much clearer picture of what he has in mind. Look at verse 37. He tells us, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Is there a contradiction? No. There's no contradiction in the command to love and what he's teaching here. I believe verse 37, it makes it clear 
that when it comes to the mission that the apostles were being given, and this goes with our mission as well, love for God must come first above all things. The point of verses 34 and 30 through 36 is to illustrate that when we take up the mission of Christ, it may result in conflict with the world. And, you know, when we're talking about the topic of anticipating persecution earlier on in this passage, what point was made? The point was made that that persecution, it may come by the hand of our own family. I think there are some of us here, even this morning, even within these walls or out in the parking lot, some of us know firsthand that choosing Christ, it can cause conflict with others. Even among our family. And I've even had people tell me, even before they were baptized, they told me, they said that they know when they become a Christian that it is going to cause problems even with their close personal family. And yet they still make that choice to do so. Praise be to God for that. Verse 37 makes it clear we cannot put those that we love in this world ahead of our love for God. God must come first. Verse 38, 39, he goes on to say, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We've already talked about this once before when we were talking about those that would follow Christ and said that they wanted to follow Christ. The point was made then and it's made here. There is a cost to discipleship. Because again, already in the book of Matthew, Christ taught His disciples, count the cost of discipleship. Make sure you know what you're getting into. It was important for the apostles to understand that before they did what they did. I'll think about Luke 14, verses 26 through 28. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? A couple of different Applications I think we can get from these thoughts. First being the fact that evangelism, our mission that we're talking about, our mission to do God's will, it is never going to be as effective as it should be when we're you know, concerned about what fulfilling that mission might cost us. Count the cost. Be willing to take the cost. And as we reflect on that point, I want us to ask all of us to ask a very important question, myself included. Do we let worldly things come between us and the Lord? It's interesting that he points to family over and over in this passage. And I think that's purposeful. Because pretty much everyone agrees that, pretty much everyone agrees that family is easily regarded as one of the most important things that there is in this life. It's one of our major priorities. If not first, it's near the top. The Bible even talks over and over about the responsibilities that we have towards our families. We're to honor father and mother. We're to support those in our household. But this passage makes it clear that even though that's all true, the clear order of importance, it has to have God at the very top. When you examine your life, like I said, family is important. But as important as that is, when you examine your life, do you let those very important things get in the way of the most important thing? Do your worldly relationships, do they interfere with your relationship to God? If that's the case, you need to make a change. It's important. So we go on and we finish the rest of this chapter. He says, starting in verse 40, He says, Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Leaving this passage, there's a lot of application we can make, but the application I want to make, especially as we think about how this relates to our mission of evangelism, 
is it shows the importance of supporting the work that the apostles were being given, but even in just supporting the work that God gives us to do. And as of course, this is being given to the apostles. You know, Jesus is giving this to the apostles. This is a passage that's meant to be a comfort to the apostles that are about to embark on this mission. Just as he told them earlier that those that might reject Jesus, they would reject uh, the apostles as well. Jesus also tells them those that belong to Christ, well, they're going to support them. Even in Matthew chapter 10 with this limited commission, the reality was that among Christ's disciples at the time, people were going to play different roles. He was sending out the 12 apostles. But there were others that were going to be involved in this work as well. The apostles, they were going to need support. Remember earlier in the passage, they were not going to have provisions because people were going to support them. Paul even says regarding the church modern day, it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. I also think of another passage that goes well with that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul illustrates the church uh, in a parallel with the body. And it talks about how the body has many members or, or body parts, you could say. And each of those members, they do different things. They have different functions, but all of their functions are vital. I believe sometimes we have the mindset that unless we're standing in a pulpit as I'm doing now, unless we're teaching a class, unless we're the one that's actually baptizing people into Christ, that we are not valuable in evangelism. Brethren, that is absolutely false. The Bible refutes that in a variety of ways. Because I can tell you as one that speaks from a pulpit every single week, I can tell you how vital you are to the work. You know, this congregation supports me. And usually when we think of supporting the preacher, we think of uh, monetarily. And the church supports me well in that regard. And I appreciate that. But that's not the only way that you support me. You build me up. You're an encouragement to me. You're a support that I need. This congregation, not only with me, but you provide support for others to spread the word. The reality is, is that without you, I, I would still seek to teach. I would still seek to preach. Those men that you support, they would likely still seek to do that as well. But with your support, how much more effective can we be with this work? I want you to understand something. The work of a preacher, and I've understood this more the past year and a half, more than I've ever understood it. The work of a preacher, and I want to tack on to that, the work of elders, the work of deacons, those that would serve, especially in a public way. Sometimes this role, it can be very lonely. And I'll admit that to you. But I want you to understand, I love this church so much because your encouragement and your support it goes a lot further than you might think. The kind words, the cards that I get, that goes. That's sometimes when I'm down and I feel lonely, that's sometimes exactly what I need. And that makes a huge impact whether you realize it or not. These verses, they make reference to a reward. It says that in verse 41, 40, 40 41, 42, there's a reward. And God has promised great blessings to those that will do His will. And it is my prayer, you know, thinking about myself, it's my prayer that my work as a preacher, my work as a Christian, my prayer is that it is pleasing to God. But I want you to understand that the promise is for all that will see to the mission that we have from God. Those that support the work, He talks about they have fellowship in the work. And our hope is that we also will have fellowship in that reward that He's talking about that God offers to those who are His. As we get to our conclusion this morning, the work that the apostles were being sent out to do, it was by no means an easy task. And our task is not easy as well. And the warnings and encouragement that Jesus is giving His disciples, they are good reminders to us as well as we seek to fulfill that commission that He has given us as His disciples. We ought to anticipate persecution is going to come. We ought not fear man. Rather, we ought to have reverence for God. We also talked about the fact that there is a cost to discipleship. We must count the cost. However, 
the cost is worth it because there are great rewards for those that devote themselves to the work of the Lord. Let's learn from these things. And let's seek to do better in the work that God has given us to do today as members of His church. As we close here this morning, I want to tell you something. I love the Lord. I also love you. And because of those two things, I cannot close without telling you about the good news of Jesus Christ. Because there may be someone here this morning that is not a Christian. And if that's the case this morning, I want to tell you, again, I love you. But more importantly, God loves you. And if you're without Christ, you are lost in your sin. And you have no hope. But the good news is that because of Christ's death and His resurrection, we can put our trust in Him and He will save us. Later on in that great commission that we've been talking about or alluding to from time to time in Matthew 28, He says in verse 19 and 20, He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So it's for all of us. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This morning, if you're without Christ, He says that you can become a disciple. But you must submit to His will. You must turn from sin. You must be baptized into His name as He commands. And as we saw in Matthew chapter 10, God knows who belongs to Him. And at judgment, Jesus will stand ready to name those who are His own. And He will intercede on our behalf. So this morning, as you examine your life, if you find that you're subject to the Lord's invitation, I'd invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.